theaters where young men sometimes turn frustration and rage into evil. And so it was for Mike Tyson. And I had to fight all the time, you know what I mean? And I used to get the crap kicked out of me. And I was so mad, you know what I mean? I used to have, you know, because I used to have a self-esteem. But had to, you knew deep down inside that you could do something, but you just, you just were, was afraid, you know what I mean? And that's the part of intimidation. You know what I mean? You were just afraid. You know what I mean? You are afraid you were getting hurt. You are just afraid. I was just afraid. As a young child, really, Tyson was a tormentor. Against his mother's pleas, he turned to crime before he was a teenager. But once he was sent to the Try and Reform School, Mike Tyson met a man who taught him that life could be a whole lot more than street mugging in desperation. Constantine Costamato ran a boxing program in a gym over a New York police station. Tyson was only 13 years old. But Costamato made an impression. When people are brought up in a very rough, tough neighborhood like Michael in Brooklyn, they develop layers and layers and layers upon their personality to exist in that kind of place. And what Cus did was methodically, through gaining Michael's trust and teaching him, was strip away those so he could deal with Michael, the person, the good person that's underneath, not all that garbage that's up on top, and you know, for the neighborhood guy. In time, with Tomato as a teacher, and later quite literally a surrogate father, Mike Tyson gained confidence, self-esteem, and a championship. In 1986, Tyson's knockout of Trevor Burbick made him the youngest heavyweight champion in history. Yet instead of joy, so much of Tyson's life was steeped in sorrow and tragedy. The deaths of Customato and later manager Jim Jacobs began to unravel him. Mike Tyson needed help, and fast. Yeah, I can be a, a complete jerk, you know what I mean? There's um, a lot of things about me that sometimes I don't like. You know what I mean? But the real friends pointed out, you know, regardless, is I'm going to kick him in that butt. I'm going to say, never come around me again. Mike, you know you did this. This is the problem. This is your problem. It's not that you hang out all night. It's because you think that you're, you think that you're God or this or that. You know I mean, because you got to get caught up, you know, people of position. And this country um, breeds it. People of position must be treated with respect and you have to be treated a certain way. And sometimes you get caught up, you know, but we're not God. He was drowning fast. He's not, Mike, Mike has only been taught one thing. He's done other things, but since Mike was 12 or 13 years old, the only thing he's been taught, and he's been taught to be the best in the world at is fighting. Don King has taught Mike to be a man. He's teaching Mike to be a man. Mike can see him. He visualizes himself in Don, and there's a lot of things that Don can tell Mike, and he knows that Don has experienced the way that he's experienced it, so it's easy for him to, to accept it from Don. The relationship means a lot. And Don has been with Mike night and day. He really cares about Mike. There's no doubt about that. I think it was more of more of what of what Mike Tyson thought he needed, and whose shoulder he could lean on. Uh, and that, in that sense, he related better to King. Don King. Mike Tyson's advisor, boxing promoter, no stranger to controversy, no stranger to troubled athletes. As a convicted and later pardoned felon himself, King related to Tyson's troubles by recalling his own. We have a great relationship in that I respect him, he respects me, and I understand a lot of his, uh, his problems and idiosyncrasies because I suffered them before him because I came out the same ghetto that he did, you know. When I first met Don, and everything associated with him was negative. And I was going through a period of my life where um, I was just self-destructing. And I was just being torn away, eaten away, slowly but surely. And he, something more important, he did anything, he introduced me to God. In time, King assembled a training camp in Orwell, Ohio, far from the big city temptations. He helped organize Tyson's childhood friends, longtime confidants, even his first boxing trainer. What began to take shape was a core, a kind of support group of family and friends to look ahead to the future, not back to the sordid past. It was Team Tyson. Team Tyson is a, a group of guys working together, a one for all. And you know, all of us are working together for one cause, and that is for 
mic the progress and go ahead and in return when he rises all of us rise too when he got with us he all he wanted to do was play he wanted to go he wanted to shop he wanted to be here when he never wanted to sleep up 24 hours a day and, and just having fun and this and that so now when he does that with us now when it comes to a certain date we, we turn into different people. Come on, we gotta go to the gym. Come on, let's go, let's go. Come on, let's do these shit up. Do, do this, go. We gotta do this. Come on, we got do the interview, Mike. We get a guy five minutes, and I'm and I'm into sometimes being my prima donna. Nah, let him wait. This and that. And hey, Mike, come on, we gotta do this interview. Come on, man, you can't treat people like this. Who do you think you are? You can't be treating people like this. Remember when you were a little kid? And this happened. This happened. I mean, you're you, humble. Yeah, man. So are you crazy? <laughs> are you, you can't fire your friends. Yeah, guys, come on, guys, take it out. Let me play a little bit so you can get me in there if I can go, all right? Of course, while discipline is emphasized, the atmosphere isn't all dour and hard line at the training camp. <laughs> Team Tyson tries to engage Mike in outside interests like uh, basketball, a sport that, to put it nicely, isn't Mike's best. I gotta tell you, you're one of the sorriest basketball players I've ever seen in my life. No, I'm I'm great. <laughs> you got a sorry shot, Mike. I know, I'm horrible. You know, I never played sports in my life. Never in my life. Now, but you're supposed to be the athlete, man. You, the jump shot we see is, that, is I, brutal. No, I didn't, I never considered myself an athlete. Never, never done. Never. Like I see guys, I'm like Jordan and. Bird and the runners, and, you know, dude, I look at those guys, the sprinters, I say, I'm in Flojo, I say, man, this is an athlete, this is an athlete, beyond compare. Once his dreams of glory in places like this included celebrity and riches. Yet only recently, perhaps, has Mike Tyson come to know the value of true wealth is in the things that he never had quite enough of, friendship and family. He wants for family, you know what I mean? He wants to be a part of a family. And so now he's getting an opportunity to do so with a settled mind rather than all the trauma and travail. There's something about the champ that transcends languages and cultures. He's more than just a sports star, and even the mega celebrities hold him in awe. See yourself flying out of your chair as he pounds away on those guys and just screaming loud and you know, I called myself screaming loud with everyone else and usually I don't get that carried away with, with those things you know but I mean it's really wonderful to watch because it's a combination of tremendous sports uh, uh, ability uh, tremendous energy and power but at the same time it is entertainment the real Mike Tyson is the ultimate dichotomy of strength and power all rolled into a package combined with the other extreme sensitivity and kindness it's an amazing man i always tease him and say he talked like michael jackson and hit like reggie jackson mike you he punches people you punch me in the arm like to say hi and um my arm hasn't been right and i'm suing oh hi mike mike i just wanted to apologize for mentioning the odor eaters uh I just figured, you know, without socks and stuff, the guys at the gym have been talking, and I thought maybe those sneaker tamers or something in the shoes would have helped, and I didn't expect you to, to get angry. And, uh, the funny thing is, all you did was shake my hand, and this happened, but what the heck. Mr. Tyson, if I may, let me tell you, I think you're a hell of a champion. You're one of the best boxers I've ever seen, and I come from a family of boxers. We box lemons, oranges, eggs, Oh, stuff like that. I went into that business when I was about 16 years old, and I left when I was 16 years old and three months. It's too tough, much too tough, but you guys are wonderfully conditioned, and I just love the way you all operate, particularly you. You're a fine champion. I wish you luck. Stay well. Don't get hurt. God bless. Cheers. And cheers are what Mike Tyson gets when he fights. He's a compelling champion. His fights are furious and fast and final. And down goes Holmes, and that's going to be it. It's over. That's all. I came to the fight, and we got all dressed up and was going to go. And I said, I said, when the fight starts, I said, in 15 minutes. And I figured, you know, I'd get down there round three and went all the way out to Vegas, and the fight was over. So you owe me my Vegas money, and you owe me money for my arm.
I just want to make something clear, you know what I mean? Eddie, I'm sorry. You know, I really thought we were friends. I didn't really think you were going to let this air. I'm really sorry. Please don't sue me. I have enough cases. <laughs> I need some of that Mike Spinks money, that two-second money. I, I thought uh, Spinks put up a darn good fight there. Uh, he was nimble, very, very loose. Uh, particularly in the knees. I'm all in favor of rearranging the inner anatomy, uh, moving the liver over somewhere where the kidney is and pushing the stomach up into the heart. So that one little right, short right you got. Also, I like it as an uppercut because uh, a lot of people don't need this, this particular thing here. And when it's up in here, it makes them look better. Mike, watch the expression on this man's face when you hit him. Did you see? I've never quite seen a man's face and you know something hurts when you and the man's face says, now watch this guy, watch this man try to get up. <laughs> Yo, man, why you get on the TV and say, you know, I punch you in the arm and then I hurt your arm and stuff, man, why you want to say that? I was trying to just like him. Mike gives an interview like this. Yo, you know, when I'm inside the ring, what I'm trying to do, basically what I'm trying to do when I'm inside the ring is I'm trying to, um, and before I get inside the ring, before I get inside the ring, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm your friend, but in the ring, basically what I'm trying to do is punch the bone into the brain and kill the person. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I really don't sound like that. It's just that when I'm relaxed, I'm real relaxed, and I, mean, I guess I'm totally laid like, down. Yeah, well, what the heck. The heavyweight champion bears a heavy burden, too. He's expected to not only win all of his fights, but be a kind of balance of Godzilla in the ring and Mother Teresa out of it. Hey! What's Don King say? Only in America? Well, I'm living proof. I grew up in the barrio, which is a, a Spanish word for ghetto. Simply means underprivileged, difficulties in life. Well, I've somewhat overcome them, but Mike, you've way past that. I want to let you know how proud I am and how all of us in the neighborhood live vicariously through you. Keep on keeping on because you set an example for a lot of us. In the Soviet Union, we did not know that much about this country, but one thing we knew, who the heavyweight champions were. So when I'm saying that Mike Tyson is a great fighter. I'm not just talking for America. I'm talking for the other side of the world, too. Thanks, Mike, for bringing our countries a little bit closer. Mike Tyson came out of the ghetto and has become not only a legend, but the world champion of boxing. His life is an example not only to those who watch him box, but to the downtrodden and the left out and the left behind that someday they too, maybe not become world champion boxers, but become world champion people. It's the American dream. We've got to expand it, recapture it for all people. Mike Tyson and Don King. They make a colorful alliance. Mike's the star of the show and Don plays P.T. Barnum. Donald King understood television as Pete Rozelle understood it in the National Football League as certainly Peter Ubroth understood it with baseball, David Stern with the NBA, who understands it better than him, Donald King so too with boxing. Whether using closed circuit, HBO specials, pay-per-view, Donald King has been on top of the scene. Often controversial, never unnoticed. I think that King as a promoter and as uh, a star uh, probably has been uh, a plus for boxing. I understand Dan King. He really is a truly spectacular promoter and an awfully good businessman. He's a very, he's a very good guy. I'm from Cleveland, so is he. I knew Don King when I was this tall. My uncle and Don used to be friends and used to hang out. And I, he was Mr. King when I was a kid back in Cleveland. Don, probably one of the greatest businessmen in the world. He'll never get the credit that he deserves as that because he's a renegade, you know? Um, Don is an inspiration. He is proof that with hard work, clean living, and honest doings, you can turn your life around from anywhere. 
And he's proof to any kid, no matter where you are, and no matter what you're into right now, if you do it right, you can reach the top and you can live with pride, dignity, and success clean. I don't know how he does that thing with the blowtorch. It works, though. But the man who would be king is Mike Tyson. Everybody's got their eyes on the champ. He is the embodiment of the American dream to some people, an athlete for his generation, a knockout at the box office and in the ring for the small fries and the major domos. Mike, there's nobody like you. Can't nobody fight like you. Can't nobody beat you. And uh, you mean a lot to a lot of people. You mean a lot to me. You mean a lot to our people. And uh, don't change from the way you are because there's nobody like you, brother. Nobody. I know it's a lot of people that would like to think they can deal with you, but they can't. Uh, you yeah, kick very well. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't say it. You kick a butt very well. It is as much a part of the daily regimen as jumping rope. It's there every day alongside the champ as he peppers his speed bag. And when Mike takes the medicine bowl to tighten up the tummy, it's there too. It's the rhythm of the routine. It's the sound of the sparring session, the beats of boxing. And it's there, oh, right there right in the box. You see, Mike Tyson is, in a sense, the ultimate rap master. When he jams, though, his rap record always improves. You see, Mike really isn't too much of a TV watcher. Nah, you know what I mean? That's, that's not realistic. Nope. Mike thinks it's death, uh, cool, to be a man who kicks on the ballistics. He digs rapping on the mic. Hi. We're all in oops. How you doing? I'm the Fresh Prince. Yo, I'm DJ Jazzy Jeff. This is, this is DJ Jazzy Jeff. I said See, that. Look, I was telling him, you know, a lot of people don't know that Mike Tyson trains the rap music. You know, people didn't know that. You know, listen to the rap music in the background, uh, brand new funk and all that stuff playing in the background. Yeah. See, so we're in the studio right now. We're recording our new album. So, Mike, we're making some more music for you to train to, right? But see, I got a couple pointers for you. So you got to keep your hands up. got to keep your hands up. You got to keep moving, right? Keep moving. Keep moving. Right hand, and then an uppercut with right hand. Then come over top with the left hand, and it's a knockout, right? But see, then if that doesn't work, yeah. you got to go. Yeah. What's up? Mike, take it to him. Good luck, man. Good luck. I have some more stuff to tell him, man. I'm the type of guy to let you keep believing it. Go ahead and work while I do this. Yep. Mike plays the hits all right. DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, Public Enemy, Cool Mo D, LL Cool J. Mike thinks Cool J is pretty cool, too. Yeah, well, me personally, I feel that Mike Tyson is an incredible champion. He's definitely knocking heads off shoulders at a, on a frequent basis. Yeah, quick hands. He's definitely a boxer. A lot of people don't think he's a boxer, but I think he's a boxer because I watch him very closely. You know what I mean? And I always say that I want to make hit records for as long as he's champion because I feel like he's going to be champion a long time. He's very electrifying, very electrifying. And one day I was watching him, um, I was watching him rap. And it was just going to the him and Big Daddy Kane was just entertain the public just for the fun of it which was great I thought because people never get to hear them when they're not on tour and I mean the the response that he takes he just falls into a trance he falls into a trance and when he lets go it's unbelievable what comes out of his mouth I one day I was with him he's making up a rhyme you know I mean? which people they don't have a great um conscious of it you know I mean you know I mean? it takes a lot of talent really he's talking he talk and as he he's talking he make up a rhyme and I said, can you do that again? He said, no. He just made up a great rock.
biggest fans, but I think you're lacking in one area, and it's in the footboard. So I'm going to show you a few things that maybe you can just use. You take a lunge out to the right, you're going to punch the guy out, you're going to kick him away, and then drop down see how he's doing. Try it again. You take a lunge, punch the guy out, kick him away, and see how he's doing. Want to try it up to tempo, Mike? I think you got it now. Here we go. Five, six, seven, eight, and punch. Kick it down. Punch. Kick him away. Hit. Yeah, Mike. That's it. Five, six. Here we go, Mike. Try this the harder stuff. Here we go. Yeah, Mike. Go on. <laughs> yeah. You know, Mike, if you do what we just did here, I think you're going to be just okay, right? Yeah. But don't you forget it. Mike, do me a favor, look straight in the camera to start with, because I'm trying to keep these two lights off the sides of your nose here. And Kenny Rogers, one of America's light. most cherished and accomplished musical talents, is also a critically acclaimed photographer. Add to that the fact that he's an avid and knowledgeable boxing fan, and it makes for an interesting environment when Kenny and Mike met for a photo session one day recently. Mike, I did a book about two years ago called Your Friends and Mine. It was all celebrities. And uh, this is a book you should definitely have been in. I think you were pretty busy defending, Hello, your, you? defending your title or something. Yeah, four years I must have been just kidding it. <laughs> you have one of the nicest smiles. I mean, from the first time that when you came to Vegas and I saw you and you came in there, it was so strange because I had always seen you as everyone else had in the ring before you came out. And, and when you smile, it just kind of lit up the whole room. And everybody in the room was talking about how they'd never seen you smile. You should smile more often. Yeah. You I don't like the smile. Next, you know, next, I time, next time, I don't, you go, I don't like the smile. The people take advantage of you. It's you smile. It's just a soft smile. But Mike Tyson is is an unusual man. I mean, and I must say, I'm extremely impressed with him as the person and an individual. Um, what I like about him is that he is. There's still that in his heart, he's still Bedford Stuyvesant. And he doesn't want to lose it. And I think his biggest fear is becoming something that he's not comfortable with mm. because of what has been provided and allowed him. And I think there's a real charm in trying to retain that, that street warmth because, I mean, there's a camaraderie that happens. I was brought up in the ghetto in Houston. And when you have friends in that environment, they are truly friends. And, and when you grow and become something else, your biggest fear is that they won't relate to you anymore. I think it's easier for him to go back and relate to his friends than it is for his friends to relate to him having accomplished what he's accomplished. And that's the way I shoot people one of three ways. Either the way you see yourself, which is sometimes different from the way the average person sees you, or the way the average person sees you, which is pretty much like this, or in a way you've never been seen before. And that, to me, would be with the pigeons or something. I know, but you know, it's so funny because... Um for someone to really, you know, you try in, in your pictures and you try in interviews to get a caption of a person's whole barometer. Yeah. And it's really, you know, I mean, it's unfair because a person like looking outside and not being objective, you re they really never know unless you live with it. You really yeah. never get to know the person yeah. really the way that you want to. Give me, give me the Stevie Wonder impression where you kind of roll your head back. Now, you know what I'm talking about. Roll it back. Get a big smile. I want to see it. Oh, God. I can promise you I'll print that. This looks like your Stevie Wonder impression. <laughs> Sometimes I think I think Kenny and Mike hit it off beautifully, sharing common experiences and learning about each other's worlds. Mike told Kenny a funny story about how one day kids he visited in school tossed a 35-pound medicine ball to him the wrong way. Come on, let's play the medicine ball. I'm trying to play Big Brother. Yeah. All right, I threw the ball. I'm hitting with the ball. Right? I'm tight now. Hit with the ball. All right, I'm hit you, right? They hit me right here. Come on, mate. I'm showing him all my muscles. So I hit the ball. Wing. <laughs> okay. And that bothers me. So much for playing with the kids. Like, what's wrong with these kids here? 
They traded off more stories, but what became the common thread in the conversation was a need for both of the men to maintain a focus and a passion for work and a personal sense of who they are. You hear everybody telling you things, and you really want to believe everything. Yeah. You know, yeah. you want to believe it. It's hard to separate truth from fantasy and these things. But, but you know, you, like they say, "Thou shalt not lie to thyself." You really, really know the truth. Long even, though you don't, even though you don't want to believe it, you really deep down inside know the truth. And that's the way I feel. I feel you can tell me whatever you want to tell me, and you can tell the press and everybody else whatever you want to tell them. But in your heart, you need to know what's real. And if you do, then you can deal with everything. He has a tremendous amount of depth that I think when you first conceive photographing a person you can see photographing what you think that person is when you meet that person and he becomes something else it changes your perception and opens up a lot of alternatives as a way of photographs unfortunately our time was so limited that i didn't get a chance to shoot a picture that i would love to shoot which he has agreed to let me do sooner or later you know the the fact that mike tyson raises pigeons for me to have a photograph of him with his pigeons and he has a dog called terminator that, that I think that's a, that's a side of Mike that, that most people will not get to see. And it's a picture that, that I've never seen that doesn't exist. And that's the one I'd like to do. But for the pictures he did get to do, Kenny captured a rare glimpse of an often misunderstood man. The photographs will endure. And Kenny says, so will his respect for Mike's character. Nice to see that you are what you think you are. Not necessarily what people think you are, but what you think you are. Uh, in your heart, the only advice I can give you is don't be afraid of that tender side of Mike Tyson. It's a side that gives me tremendous respect for you and much more appreciation for you, the man. dictates no room for compassion here. This is a hurting business. Softness is frowned upon. It is viewed as a weakness, a poison. But far from this world, far from the wreckage of the fallen gladiators, is the mortal man, the man who hungers and cries out for love, who seeks to find ways to satisfy his longing soul, I'm cried out, man. I cried so many times, I, mean, I can't cry anymore. For most of his young life, Mike Tyson has ached in that longing. He sought approval in the streets by being a hood, but it only got him locked up. He would quietly, humbly, pursue a sense of goodness and gentleness in the solitary moments with his pigeons. They were for him a kind of metaphor, for they too were cooped up. They too needed to soar. Mike Tyson, of course, found his self-esteem in the brutality of the ring. But his image of the barbaric warrior belies his inner need to become whole. I mean, you have to um, learn about the responsibility of being a heavyweight champion. You know, I mean, you have to help the weak. He's a guy that has a heart as big as all outdoors. He's uh, generous. He's compatible. He's understanding. And I've spent some time with him, and he has a tremendous heart. A huge heart. I mean, this guy would do anything for someone that needs help. And this is the kind of Mike Tyson that the majority of people doesn't know. This is the story of the heart of the champion. As surely as it beats passionately and ferociously in the ring, it is a heart full of desire to make life better for ones in need. When I mean, you really think about it, I was lucky. You know what I mean, I come from a bad home, and the environment is extremely violent, and... Anything could have happened to me. I was vulnerable for anything to happen. You know, I, mean, I could have 
been abused when I was a kid. I mean, someone could have snatched me off the street, someone could have hurt me bad. Um, and even though I'm vain in my own little way, I mean, I, I like to look after people that's less fortunate. At this time... This year, Mike Tyson was awarded an honorary doctorate at Central State University in Ohio. Though he was a high school dropout, Central State was decorating Iron Mike for his egalitarian contributions to his community and to its people. We conferred the degree because Mike Tyson goes back to his neighborhood to try to inspire uh, young people who are coming up under circumstances uh, similar to the ones that he has been exposed to. We honored Mike Tyson because he was the first one to go to the Sugar Ray Robinson family and donate $25,000 to start the foundation. We honored Mike Tyson because he is responsible for feeding thousands of people in Cleveland and in Chicago and in uh, New York during various holidays, those that can, could not feed themselves. I really don't care to try to influence that or have people look at that side of me, you know what I mean? Why? I mean, because you know, it really is none of their business, you know what I mean? People, so you don't, don't have to know I mean, what I do. I prefer people to just think of me, wow, that Tyson guy is a killer. He'll kick you or you know what. And what he does, often without fanfare, speaks volumes for the heart of the champion. Donating truckloads of turkeys for Thanksgiving. Supporting the families of slain New York policemen. Riding on horseback in Manhattan to try and help raise funds for causes. Stories of walking up to homeless people in the streets and making their day. And one day with this lady, I gave her like a thousand dollars, she had to grab me and kiss me and stuff, and I said, oh, what the heck? That's something that people remember forever. It's not going to be real. Michael Tyson is here. Undoubtedly, however, Mike Tyson's work with the retarded is both a poignant and powerful legacy. Last year, he helped sponsor the Mike Tyson Young Adult Institute in New York. The program seeks funding for permanent resident housing for retarded citizens. It is no small undertaking on Tyson's part, and it is not merely lip service. Nothing is doing something that's satisfying. It's just seeing the outcome of people's faces and make them happy. I do love you. I love this guy a lot. Mike Tyson has also been active in one of the most successful endeavors for the retarded community, the Special Olympics offering dignity and a sense of accomplishment for those people who for too long have been denied. I've seen him uh, uh, work with Special Olympians, hug them, help them, teach them uh, to play uh, volleyball, to play uh, basketball, or to just lift weights, or to, to show them a few moves in boxing and so. And the way he, he hugs them and the way he teaches them, you, sh you can see the love that he has in, in him that he wants to share. And that is the human being that is very important for, I think, anyone in the world to know. And I like retarded kids. But it touch your heart? Huh? Does it touch your heart? Um, it hurts me because they never, um, they're sentenced and they never did a crime. Strength is manifested in more than muscle and sweat. There is a power more profound than in the ways one man dominates another physically. The heart of the champion beats boldest when it seeks and finds love in all of its glory and in all of its beauty. You taught me the magic of believing. We all need each other to be strong.
when I think of hero, I never um, look at myself as a, as a hero. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? For that word, you know, I think of guys of heroes. You think of guys like Joe DiMaggio or Joe Lewis, you know, or Ray, Ray Robinson. Um, Why don't you think you're a hero? Um, it's just not um, a style. It's not, it's not a, um, a part of my character. You know, it, you get that um, the title pressed on you, but it's just, I, could, I don't picture myself because people that I think of heroes, I would never mention my name in the same breath that they're like, when people talk about Muhammad Ali and me fighting, you know what I mean, me thinking about fighting Joe Lewis, you know what I mean, I, I shy away from that. I would never even want to think of that. You know what I mean, I think it's a sin to even think of you being, myself being in the same ring with those guys. Do you think kids need heroes though? They should use heroes, they should make themselves heroes. And to themselves, they should worship themselves first before they worship somebody else. Well, I believe in having a great deal of confidence in yourself and doing the right thing and believing in God. You know what I mean? And that's great, you know what I mean? But um, it's very difficult, you know what I mean? For some, a young kid to take that faith in God, you know what I mean? Now somebody holding their hand and leading them the way. You know I mean, I believe in people believing in themselves and saying, well, no one but the mate, the creator done this for me. You know what I mean? But as far as somebody like me or, or you know, you should take the energy of, or the positive energy of somebody have, or a singer or anything, and be the best of you, what you can be. Don't say, well, you're a great basketball player, but I want to be like Mike Tyson, I'm going to fight. You know, be with the best you can be. Fear feels like, um, like a feeling of, of being hungry or thirsty, you know what I mean? If you don't know, you're going to get the food. If you, there's no means of getting the food, you're panicked. You know what I mean? Your panic and your emotions will probably just, I mean, swallow you, devour you a whole. And it's just like fear, it's like fire. If you learn to make it work for you, I mean, you can make it heat the house for you. You can, I mean, do things with campfires. And if you let it um, get out of control, it could kill you and kill everything around you. And it's to control your feelings. I, I told you I have to be kicked in the butt, mud in my face, you know what I mean, to learn. And the only thing I can say to someone, you know what I mean, it's difficult, you know what I mean. Sometimes you overcome, sometimes you don't. But the only thing you could do is just um, go to God, you know what I mean, love God. It's just all you can do when you're in a circumstance like that and you really believe in them. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to take a young kid that feels, I could get $20,000 if I sell this or rob this place to believe in God. He's been living, believing in God ever since he was a little boy in church and it didn't bring him anything. But it's all in believing and never giving up. You know what I mean? Because all athletes that are at the top level know a winner never quit and a quitter never wins. And sometimes it's when things seem rough, you mustn't give up. It just seems you can't give up because once you give up, you're through, you're lost. Some guys have been singing all their life, fighting all their life, 10 years, 20 years, Joe Wilcox, 12 years before he got a title shot, fighting and fighting. He never got, gave up and he won a title and everyone knows him and loves him all over. Imagine how many times it went through his head, I'm gonna give this up. And you know what I mean, you just, I can't give up, you just can't. You, you must continue and go on, the worst it seems, you know what I mean? You know what I mean, because the bad times don't last forever. You know what I mean, it's just that people give up. And as long as you, you don't give up, you never lose. No matter how long it takes.